Euromax Highlights. And here's your host, Anne O'Donnell. Hello and welcome to Euromax Highlights, where we round up the best bits of the week for you. Let's have a look and see what's coming up on today's show. Time to keep how one blogger is stirring up the clock industry. Time to party how Wrocław celebrates being European capital of culture. And time to sleep, a spaced out hotel in the Czech Republic. The world of luxury watches has always been something of a closed club, but social media is changing that. One blogger who's fanatical about watches has broken into this elite branch. Anish Bat takes photos of luxurious men's watches and in the process has developed quite a following on Instagram. So let's have a look at how luxury brands are jumping on his social media bandwagon to sell their products. The Luxury Watch Fair in Geneva, or SIHH for short, is one of the most prestigious in the business. Top brands like Cartier present their latest treasures, but not just to anyone. Only selected journalists and industry insiders are welcome. The watchmaking field has traditionally been secretive and elitist, but that's starting to change. Watch bloggers like Anish Blatt are opening up this exclusive world to all timepiece connoisseurs. Everyone around the world that, that is, is looking to see what's happening can see instantly all the novelties, all the new pieces, get hands-on, get videos, get opinions. Um, in, in something which is instantaneous, you know, it, it's, uh, it was unheard of probably five years ago. It's nine in the morning in Geneva, an outdoor photo shoot all in white. Bot and his team are taking pictures of new models by a German watchmaker. With the world premiere tomorrow at the trade fair, the British blogger will be treating his readers to an exclusive preview. Bot has 1.5 million Instagram followers, making him the undisputed king of digital watch writers. No other blogger presents watches so elaborately and extravagantly. The 34-year-old's visual language stands out in what's still a conservative watch scene. I try to show like my taste through the pictures and the content that we make, you know, because I love watches, but I also love to travel. I like nice restaurants. I like cigars. I like to drink, you know, nice, uh, nice cognacs and 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 uh, fine wine and things like this. So, so it's all of these kind of things together. Bot's blog has been up and running since 2012. Watch Anish has seen its fan base grow steadily. His influence in the watch industry has grown too. But Bot is not the only influential blogger. Worn and wound in the United States and watched by SJX in Singapore can also make or break a new model. The watch industry is only slowly waking up to this fact. Change is not something that they do very easily. Um, so I think they're afraid, but I, I think now they see that they can't really ignore it anymore because it's, it's knocking at their door every single day and their end consumers are the ones that are coming to them. It's now late afternoon in Geneva and the final preparations for the trade fair are being made. One manufacturer that understood the influence of the blogosphere some time ago is Roger Dubuis. It invited bloggers to view its newest creations even before the show opened. A shrewd move because consulting firm Deloitte reports that social media are the most important marketing tool in the watchmaking industry. When we have a customer who tell us we have been seeing on watch a niche, this type of new models, can you show it to us? So our barometer is very easy that we have dealers, we have about 160 dealers in the world, plus 25 stores, and as soon as you start to speak with them in details, on if possible with good words about what we are doing, the effect is immediate on customers coming to our stores. In the watchmaking field, classic print advertising and glossy industry magazines used to be the most important means of communication. But blogs and social media now provide companies with rapid feedback from customers. Anish Bhatt has a 300,000 euro a year consultant contract with manufacturers. 
He also gets little gifts, like this. But Bot says he can't just bow uncritically to everything they make, or his blog would soon lose its followers. If you dilute and you become too commercial, or you start talking about things that really you know are not good products, or you know in your heart is not something that you would talk about, but you do it for money, eventually your audience will see that. You know, your audience are not stupid because they connect with you because they, they know you, they know your taste. That's why they follow you. And so he continues to cater to those followers by seeking and rating the most expensive, rare, and extravagant watches out there and photographing them in equally stylish settings. But it has been called a hub of higher education, a meeting place, and now it can boast the title European Capital of Culture. I'm talking about the Polish city of Wrocław, southwest of the capital, Warsaw. In its checkered history, the city has changed hands countless times over the centuries. At one point, it was the third largest city in Germany. Rotswaf is now being celebrated for its rich cultural history. So let's have a look at how they kicked off the celebrations. The four spirits of Rotswaf descend on the Central Market Square to launch Awakening, the opening event ringing in the city's year as European capital of culture. Visitors and locals have over a thousand different events to choose from as Wrocław promotes its more cosmopolitan side in 2016. Wrocław is great for tourists because it's not as overcrowded as Krakow or Warsaw. You can feel it and it's a really fresh atmosphere, really, so I think that uh, Wrocław deserves this. The show alone shows how fantastic our city is. Rehearsals for the opening night show lasted six months. The event was the brainchild of Chris Baldwin, a British theatre director also known for designing two events for the 2012 Olympics in London. Wrocław has a huge story to tell. What happened to it in the 20th century? It was Breslau, it was German, it was predominantly Protestant, uh, it had a large Jewish community, and it became sadly to say, one of the huge symbols of the destruction and disaster of the 20th century. The Second World War left Wrocław in ruins. Much of the German population fled westward as the Soviet army approached in early 1945. The rest followed when, after centuries of Austrian, Prussian and German sovereignty, Silesia became Polish under the terms of the Potsdam Conference. The city has since been restored to its former glory, with the red brick Gothic era city hall a towering reminder of German influence over hundreds of years. Wrocław's location on the Oder River saw it become an important trade center back in the Middle Ages. It's now the fourth largest city in Poland and has learned to reinvent itself. The city had to develop a new identity, and it took several decades. In 2016, we want to show how that identity was created. This entails a series of new building projects for the European Capital of Culture Year, including the Capital Musical Theatre and the New Horizon Cinema, which hosts the annual Wrocław Film Festival. And just in time for this year's festivities, the National Music Forum opened in September. The multi-venue facility was designed to cement Wrocław's reputation as a music hub, thanks also to innovative and interactive events. Today we have this glorious arena to show off our program. Until now, we've had to settle for churches or improvised spaces. The building will, above all, benefit the quality of music available in Wrocław. Wrocław will also be hosting a range of major art exhibitions in 2016. The Museum of Dreams gives old paintings new meaning through performance, such as the very topical motif of the baby Jesus and his parents having to flee to a foreign country.
Man geht hier durch die Stadt und es stehen hier diese riesigen Romanen. Walking through the city, you notice these huge Romanesque churches. They used to be packed with art, which is currently housed in the medieval section of this museum. The works are enormous, unsettling and beautiful, and absolutely captivating. And not just for me. There has also been a strong emphasis on inclusion and community involvement. Last summer, Chris Baldwin launched a project that transformed 27 of the city's characteristic bridges into performance stages. We linked sports with culture, uh, storytelling with celebration of city, and uh, it was a huge success. And these are the first two of four major projects that when they come together call, are called uh, uh, the, the Flow Quartet. And Wrocław has plenty to offer the younger generation too. The city's university was founded in 1702 and students comprise one in five residents. So the nightlife is pretty lively and set to get even livelier in this special year. Young people have a great life here. You can party, but you can also develop intellectually. Wrocław used to be known mainly for its clubbing scene. I hope we'll now also get a reputation as a city of the arts. This year is a good opportunity for Europeans to get to know young people here and to see that we don't think the same as our politicians. We are open to Europe and its opinions. Wrocław has always been at the crossroads of the continent and is now a symbol of reconciliation and cooperation, qualifying it as a European capital of culture. Well, we're off now to the Czech Republic to show you what sleeping in a TV tower might be like. We are in the Jested Hotel, which is also the area's main landmark in this popular winter sports region. In fact, it doesn't look like a hotel at all from the outside because it doubles up as a TV tower. The hotel books out as well pretty fast because you have a bird's eye view of much of Bohemia, parts of Poland and Germany. This is Jested Mountain. And on top of it, the famous 94-meter-high TV tower, which houses the Jested Hotel. The building in the Czech city of Liberec is an impressive sight, provided the weather's on your side. In winter, the tower is often shrouded in fog. Taking the cable car up is almost a mystical experience. In the winter, a special atmosphere pervades the mountain. No one knows this better than Alesh, who's worked at the hotel for years. In the winter, like in other seasons, you can enjoy stunning views from here. But sometimes you get to experience this kind of snowy winter wonderland we're having today. Scenery that many guests appreciate from behind observation windows. There are no cars and no traffic, only nature. The snow, the wind, friendly people everywhere, and the quiet. Like cloud nine, it's great. The hotel has 19 rooms on two floors. And two of them still have the original 1970s furniture that was created by interior designer Otakar Binar. The other rooms were redesigned. The look of the hotel, reminiscent of a spaceship or an airplane, was preserved. A night at the Eshted Hotel costs between 55 and 130 euros. The futuristic tower opened in 1973, after 10 years of construction. It was a sensation at the time, partly because of its unusual construction materials. Porcelain was used in the hallway, and a wall in the lobby is made of exposed concrete and bohemian glass art. Milena Lanska, chairwoman of the Jested 73 Club, wants to preserve the hotel as it was. She works closely with the original interior designer. He's drawn up plans to build reconstructions of the furniture. The lights. This was the small lounge 40 years ago, and today. 
Refurbishing it took a year and cost 22,000 euros. After that, the bar was refurbished. Soon the exterior of the tower will be renovated. It's exposed to extreme weather conditions at a height of 1,000 meters. The Hirschet has a special atmosphere, at least people who spend a night here, they say so, and which is for me the most beautiful situation when you are actually above the clouds, you are in the sunshine, but Liberec and the whole Republic is under the clouds, and then you feel like in a spaceship. Just outside the spaceship lies the Czech skiing region of the Yezera Mountains. Covered in snow and ice, the Yeshted Hotel doesn't lose any of its appeal. In fact, it looks even more mysterious in sub-zero temperatures. Well, this week, all the fashionistas descended on Berlin for Fashion Week. One young Austrian designer, Marina Hermannseder, is very much in demand at the moment. Leather straps and buckles are her thing. So needless to say, Lady Gaga is a big fan. And she's not alone either. There wasn't an empty seat in the house on Thursday when she showed off her latest collection in Berlin. Even museums have expressed interest in exhibiting her unusual designs. A taste of haute couture in the German capital. Marina Hermann's Eda's newest collection is specially handcrafted, a rare sight on the catwalks during Berlin Fashion Week. One of the young Austrian designer's signature motifs is the buckle. Her fourth collection has met with the critics' approval. Marina has her very own style. Her clothes are unmistakable, very recognizable, and that's important. They have an identity of their own, which is even more important, a signature. And she has one. Marina developed that style in London and Berlin. The Viennese designer studied at the renowned fashion schools Central St. Martins and Esmod. But she says the best preparation for her career in fashion was an internship at British label Alexander McQueen. It taught me to go without sleep and persist, to try out 20 things until I find the solution. What's not perfect will not be sent out. You have to start over again, even if it's two days before the show. And in the end, it simply has to work. Her studio is located in Berlin's Kreuzberg district. 16 people work here for the Marina Hermanns Eder label, which she founded in 2013. Marina's greatest source of inspiration is orthopedics, a field she explores in textbooks about medical prosthetics and corsets. She stumbled over this unusual trade while researching for her graduation collection which created a stir all over the world two years ago. I have a horrible fear of doctors, of anything that has anything at all to do with medicine. I need psychological counseling before the smallest vaccination. So many people can't understand why I work with medical images. But actually, I have plenty of distance from them. When I look at an orthopedic corset, I'm not thinking about the suffering and illness. I'm analyzing the whole thing. Where are the fastenings? Do they go over or under? Where are the leather straps? What could I insert into it? I take an absolutely technical view. Marina's coming winter collection is a tribute to American aviation pioneer Amelia Earhart, a woman of action like herself. Marina Hermanns Eder is not only a designer, she's also a businesswoman with a degree in business management. It's the same old story. My parents told me to get a proper education. And that's why I studied business management. Back then, I suffered. I thought, what about the artist in my heart? I'm imprisoned in a golden cage. But now I know studying business was the best thing I could ever have done. Because now I know that I can't just serve art. Rather, this is a business and I have a responsibility toward other people. 
she's strengthened her brand by collaborating with big companies like here with Nike or here with Austrian Airlines. Couture, but in a classic and very wearable form. Marina's collections bridge a gap in today's fashion world. I'm never afraid that my work might be too extravagant or eccentric, too medical, because my collections maintain a balance. Of course, my heart skips a beat when I make leather constructions and add leather buckles everywhere. But my approach to fashion is that I don't just want to be an artist. I also actually want to clothe women. Few other shows at this year's Fashion Week were so highly anticipated. And Marina Hermann's Eda's models presented the new collection wearing shoes by Christian Louboutin. The Austrian is the only designer at Berlin Fashion Week who collaborates with the legendary French shoe designer. That's a great honor and yet more evidence of Marina Hermann's Eda's unusual talent. Uh, one famous winter resort in Switzerland was all over the news this week as top business leaders and politicians gathered for this year's World Economic Forum. We are talking, of course, about Davos, which incidentally is the highest town in Europe at 1,600 metres above sea level. But it's not just for business giants, you know. It's also one of the best destinations for skiers and snowboarders as well. The Swiss city of Davos is a winter sports wonderland nestled in the Alps. Whether skating on Europe's biggest natural ice rink, snowboarding, or skiing on 300 kilometers of trails, there's always something to do. Home to a population of around 11,000, Davos is a blend of traditional and modern. One of its newest landmarks is the luxury Hotel Intercontinental, which opened in 2013, also affectionately called the Golden Egg. But it was the Congress Center, built in 1969, that put Davos on the map as a location for international business and medical conferences. The best known is the annual World Economic Forum. The founder of the World Economic Forum was Professor Dr. Klaus Schwab, and he decided it should take place in Davos. He wanted its spirit, its climate, to help shape the event. It was a well-known holiday resort, and he hoped its atmosphere would help participants discuss matters in an open-minded way. That's the background to the spirit of Davos to this day. The small mountain village of Davos first came to international attention in the late 19th century as a health resort. 1,600 metres above sea level, its dry, pollen and mite-free climate made it ideal for asthmatics and TB patients. At that time in Europe, one in seven people died of TB. They weren't just sick, they actually died of it. It was a terrible plague. Wealthy patients would stay in luxury wellness clinics such as the Schatzalp, which opened in 1900 and is now a hotel. Many spent months, if not years here, following a strict health regime. Five meals a day, cold showers and hours of rest and recuperation in the fresh air. German writer Thomas Mann described the experience in his 1924 masterpiece, The Magic Mountain. He was inspired by his wife Katja's stay in Davos. His wife would tell him about characters who were often very eccentric. And he actually met some of them himself. He originally set out to write a novella, but it turned into a thousand-page novel, The Magic Mountain. Not only famous writers, but artists too were drawn to the mountains. In the center of Davos is the Ernst Ludwig Kirchner Museum. The German expressionist painter lived here from 1917 to 1930, painting much of his best-known work here. 
The museum houses some 12,000 works by Kirchner, about half his entire body of work. De Vos has left those days far behind. The last 150 years have seen the village and the Swiss Alps evolve into a place where history is made year after year. That is all we have time for today. Thank you so much for watching. And don't forget to befriend us on Facebook and let us know what you thought of the show. And we'll see you soon. Take care. Bye-bye.